Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our online information and support session. My name is Kathleen Helgeson and I'm the coordinator of the Patient and Family Resource Center. We last hosted an information session for colorectal cancer in 2019, and this is the first time that it has been offered virtually. I'm joined today by four presenters who each have a valuable perspective on this topic. We are very pleased to offer this session with the generous funding support of the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting from all regions in Manitoba, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, and Dene people, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. It's important for us to foster inclusivity and reconciliation and encourage others to do the same. Before we continue, there are some basic Zoom features I'd like to explain. You'll notice as an attendee, your microphone and your video are turned off. If you have a question for any of our presenters, just click on the Q&A icon on your screen and type your question. You can also choose to send that question anonymously by checking the send anonymously box before you click on the blue arrow to send. My coworker, Ellie, is not with us today, so I'm going to be managing your questions and we'll be sharing them with the presenters at the end of the session. So I, before we get started, I would like to find out a little bit about who's joining us today. So we just created a poll that we'd like to send you just to get a little bit of information about um, who's joining us and what your experience has been with colorectal cancer. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm just going to send a poll to your screen. So you should be seeing a poll come up. If you don't see a poll on your screen, um, don't worry, you can also send a comment in the Q&A. But the questions there are being presented to you. So there are five questions. And if you just want to scroll down and answer those questions. We just were looking for a little bit of um, information about what your experience has been. So there's five questions that we have. And this is the one disadvantage of doing things virtually is we, we don't get to know much about you, but um, I, I should let you know that the resource center here on McDermott is now open. Um, and so if you're ever here, please feel free and drop by so we can put a face to the name if you're one of um, the people joining us on our webinars. Okay, so I'm just gonna give this another half minute and then I will share the results with everyone. I'm just going to end the poll right now. We may not have captured everybody, but that just, and I'm going to share the results. So we were just asking, first of all, if you've already completed treatment for colorectal cancer, and it's looking like that 45% of you have completed colorectal, and are you receiving treatment for colorectal cancer? It looks like about 18% of you are. And in terms of surgery to treat your cancer, it looks like 82% of you have received surgery. And did your surgeon discuss whether you might need an ostomy? It looks like that 45% of you had had that discussion, whereas another 55% have not had that discussion. And also asking about dietary challenges. So some people noted here, unsure of what to eat, and unable to eat the things that I enjoy, being 9% and also problems with diarrhea and constipation, 18%. I think that I actually made an error there. I should have probably listed that as a multiple choice question so that you could click more than uh, one there, but hopefully that gives our dietitian a, a bit more information about where, where, what your experience has been like. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop sharing that poll right now. And I'm gonna start with introducing our first guest, Anna Lubetska. Anna completed her undergrad degree at the University of Winnipeg and her master's of science at the University of Manitoba. 
She graduated from medical school at the University of Manitoba in 2018 and completed her internal medicine training in 2021. Anna is now completing her last year of subspecialty training in medical oncology with plans to pursue a fellowship in the next year. So I invite Anna to come back to our screen and um, looking forward to hearing her presentation. Hi, Anna, thank you. Hi there, thanks so much, Kathleen, um, for that introduction. So, um, hello everyone, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. You can uh, let me know, Kathleen, when you see that. Sure. <laughs> Does that look okay? Yeah, that's great, perfect, thank you. Okay, excellent. So, I just have some notes here off to the side, so I apologize. Um, I won't be looking directly into the camera, um, so you'll forgive me for that. So um, I'm going to give some information so um, regarding colorectal cancer treatment, um, as well as some of the research that is ongoing um, that we're participating in here um, in uh, Cancer Care Manitoba, uh, and just to give some perspectives about some of the new directions um, that we're we're going in, as well as to talk about um, some of the treatments that you may be receiving or that you are yet to receive if, if you're pre-treatment uh, or that you may have already received. So uh, as I said, I'll discuss a little bit about colorectal cancer and some statistics. We'll discuss um, treatment options, um, both for early stage and metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, we'll discuss some clinical trials that we have ongoing, and then we'll also discuss um, what we do once you've received your treatment for surveillance, um, and then some concerns potentially with survivorship. I just wanted to put in a disclaimer just to, to let everyone know that um, everyone's cancer journey is different. What I present here is really a generalization, so it may or may not be applicable to you. Um, really, it's presented purely for information. Um, if you have any concerns or you're wondering about um, some of the things I've discussed, um, please discuss with your primary oncologist or your cancer team uh, if you have any specific questions pertaining to you. So how common is colorectal cancer? Um, it's actually considerably common. Um, about 24,000 Canadians uh, will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer um, uh, in the coming years. Um, and this is extrapolated from the cases that uh, were identified in 2022. So you can see uh, colorectal cancer makes up approximately 10% of all cancers that are diagnosed in Canada. And so that amounts to about 13,000 men and almost 11,000 women. Um, there are different stages of cancer, uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and this is important because um, it really pertains to what types of treatment you may be eligible for. And so I just wanted to go over this because this can be confusing and a little bit convoluted, um, but I'll try and give just a basic overview. Uh, again, uh, each person's cancer is a little bit different, um, and so if you have any specific questions regarding the staging of, of your cancer, I would encourage you to touch base with your team. Um, but in general, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but in the case that you might be able to, <laughs> um, I'll just direct your attention here. So this is just a blown up version of, of the layers of tissue um, in the tube that is the colon and rectum. And so here is where the bowel movement would pass. And so this is goes from the, oh, I apologize, goes from the inside um, to the outside here. So we have the mucosa, um, that's the name of that inner layer of tissue, um, and followed by the submucosa, there's some muscle layers, and then there's something called the serosa, which is sort of like a saran wrap layer on the outside to keep it all together. And then we have blood vessels, of course, that feed these tissues. And then we have lymph nodes, and these are important because they sort of collect all of the um, immune tissue and any of the cellular debris and kind of take it away and monitor what's going on in, in, the, um, 
in that sort of uh, cellular environment. And so if we look at the different stages, we can start from something called stage zero, where there are only some cancer cells on the inner lining of the colon or rectum. Um, and then cancer can progress um, through these stages. Um, and so stage one disease sort of represents the fact that the tumor has grown into the layer of the connective tissue that surrounds that mucosa and potentially into the submucosa. Um, and then stage two disease is broken, further subdivided into um, more different um, specific classifications, which I won't get into too much, but really um, the tumor's grown into that muscle layer um, and, and has potentially grown a little bit further through the wall with some caveats, um, but uh, that uh, there are some further breakdowns, but that's essentially the generalization. And then in stage three, we, you can see that the tumor tends to go through all of these layers, okay? Um, and then, um, there also are some cancer cells that may have gone into the lymph nodes. Um, again, stage three is broken down into further substages, which I won't get into just for um, getting into progressing to this talk, but, but uh, that's the generalization. And then stage four disease is where the tumor has grown certainly through all of these layers, has moved into the lymph nodes, and most commonly has spread to other organs. This may be just one other organ, um, or it may be other distant organs that are not at all close to the colon or rectum. So, the treatment possibilities that we have for colorectal cancer currently available um, compri are comprised of, of sort of three main pillars. Um, chemotherapy, which is probably uh, what I will discuss the most today, really what I will discuss the most today because that's uh, where my expertise lies. Surgery, which um, some of you may or may not have had. Um, and then radiation, again, which is something that some of you may or may not have had or will be having potentially in the future. Important to note that colon and rectal cancers are treated a little bit differently um, because of, of the way that the cancers respond to treatment. Um, in some cases, radiation and chemotherapy are given together at the same time, and this is most commonly in rectal, excuse me, in rectal cancers. Um, and this and radiation therapy may or may not be a component of colon cancer treatment. So uh, again, um, if I'm talking about chemotherapy and radiation therapy together and you're wondering, hmm, nobody ever talked about that with me, why, why not? Um, it may not be something that is appropriate for your particular kind of cancer. Both in colon and rectal cancer, at some point, surgery uh, will have been discussed uh, with you. Um, and the timing of surgery varies um, in colon and rectal cancer, largely because of some of the new evidence and research that we, we've had in the last five to 10 years. So before I get into the chemotherapy options um, and other uh, targeted treatment options, I wanted to talk about how uh, we as the oncologists um, together with you as the patient discuss how we make decisions about chemotherapy and who should get chemotherapy, what kind of chemotherapy, um, and how we, we take into consideration different things. Um, so I have a couple of different sort of, uh, sort of boxes here that describes the different things that we take into consideration. It's not an extensive list, but some of the important things. So most importantly, we take into consideration our patient's goals. Um, of course, if we're looking at curative intent treatment, um, often our goals align in the fact that we want to help you to reach a cure. Um, but really it's important because in some cases when we're not able to aim for a cure, um, then we really want to make sure that our goals are aligned with our patients. So we're not um, giving chemotherapy uh, or other treatments uh, that are not helpful to you or that do not improve your quality of life. 
Um, and that really is often the goal is that we are hoping either to help cure you um, or we're hoping to help improve your quality of life and make living with cancer um, tolerable um, and something that you can put in the back burner of your mind and continue living your life well. The other things that we consider are things like the health of our patients, um, as well as other chronic conditions that you may be dealing with. This is important because some of the chemotherapy drugs can interact with some medications that you may be on. Um, the chemotherapy drugs also can affect other medical conditions by making them worse or more prominent in your life. Um, and also uh, the way that that um, the other chronic conditions in your life may or may not impair um, your physical um, sort of uh, your physical health uh, is important because chemotherapy, as many of you know, is not easy treatment to go through, um, and we want to make sure that you're well enough, you're fit enough to tolerate that treatment. That sort of brings me down here to that tolerability aspect, where we want to make sure that. Um, the treatments that we might be thinking about are tolerable for the patients um, and something that they can get through without having too many problems uh, or problems that we are having a difficult time managing. The other things, of course, that we look at are side effects of treatments, um, as well as, as I mentioned, quality of life. And then we also look at um, in choosing specific treatment options, the biology of the disease. So how does the cancer behave? What are the molecular aspects of the cancer that might make one treatment work better than another treatment? Um, and we also look at the burden of disease. Where has the cancer spread? Um, is it in many parts of the body? Is it localized to one part of the body? And that helps us to determine, again, um, that kind of brings us full circle back to the goals, right? Um, what is our goal of treatment? Um, what can we what can we offer you uh, based on that burden of disease, the biology of disease, your overall health, whether you can tolerate it and managing side effects and quality of life over time. So there are, um, a few terms that I just wanted to explain that you may have may or may not have heard. Um, it, when we talk about chemotherapy or treatments, we talk about chemotherapy or treatments that are given in an adjuvant fashion or given in a neoadjuvant fashion. And so adjuvant chemotherapy or therapy um, is treatment that's given after you've had a surgery, usually aiming for eight to 12 weeks after surgery. And that sort of accounts for recovery time, feeling well enough to be able to undergo chemotherapy or other treatments. Um, and this is the purpose of adjuvant chemotherapy is to prevent recurrence of cancer and to help reduce that risk of recurrence of cancer. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is treatment that's given prior to surgery. Um, and the goals there are to shrink the tumor, potentially, hopefully, as well as to make it um, to make it easier to remove for the surgeons um, and also to improve the chances if there was potentially a tumor that was looking like it might not be able to be removed, potentially improving the chances of getting things smaller to a point where it potentially is removable. This also um, is given in order to help reduce the risk of recurrence. As we know, if we can get a better surgical result, much of the time that can, um, that can also, not always, but that can help to translate um, to um, a reduced risk of recurrence in the future. So um, now we can kind of go over to uh, the drugs, the specific drugs. And so what are the drugs that we use? Um, I've listed them as single agents, but as, as some of you will know, um, these drugs are often given in combination, usually two drugs together. Um, and these ones that I've listed here are our most common drugs that we give in early stage disease. Um, and so um, you might see something called 5-fluorouracil, otherwise uh, we'll, I'll be referring to it as 5-FU moving forward. Capecitabine, which is a very similar drug to 5-fluorouracil, but but an oral, sort of like an oral version of 
it, uh, which is nice. It doesn't require um, an, you know, an infusion. Um, the trade name is Zalota. Uh, and then Oxaliplatin, that's another drug that is often paired with capecitabine or 5 5-FU. And then the last drug that might be familiar is something called irinotecan. And, and again, these are our most common drugs that are used in this sphere. Um, most commonly, um, the pairings of 5-fluorouracil uh, with oxaliplatin or capecitabine with oxaliplatin, or the 5-FU and the capecitabine with um, either or paired with irinotecan. So another um, form of drugs that uh, are probably uh, newer, although uh, they have been available probably now for the last five to 10 years, are, are drugs that are not chemotherapy, but can work in conjunction with chemotherapy. And these are often known as targeted therapy. And they have a few, um, there are a few categories of targeted therapy. One of them is something called uh, monoclonal antibodies. So these are targeted, these are targeted drugs that target specific proteins, and the proteins often support growth of cancers. And so um, we target those proteins um, to help to, to, um, to uh, help to sort of get rid of those cancers to stop them from growing. Um, we also have a category called multi-kinase inhibitors. Um, those also target specific cellular enzymes and they, they, um, they prevent the survival and function of cancer cells. Um, and finally, we have what you may actually be most familiar with because it often is in the news, uh, something called immunotherapy. And so essentially immunotherapy works by targeting the breaks on the immune system um, and it helps to activate the immune system to help to act against cancer. Cancer cells tend to try and hide from the immune system and these drugs tend to uh, remove that hiding feature um, and expose the cancer to targeting by the immune system. Oh, okay. Um, so while some of you may be familiar with some of the side effects associated with chemotherapy, um, <clears throat> I thought I would go over some of the more specific side effects that are associated with some of our very common drugs. I should say that um, each drug really does have its own side effect profile, although they often can overlap. Um, your primary clinic, uh, either has or will uh, provide you with information around the drugs that you're receiving in a written handout. Um, and we always um, try to support you through treatment by providing supportive medications to help manage um, the side effects. And, and these certainly should be um, um, provided to you through your primary uh, clinic. So 5-FU, um, I'll start with that one. Um, the most common couple of side effects are diarrhea, um, which can be very troublesome, um, low blood counts, um, which certainly poses an infection risk. Um, and when I say low, low blood counts, really that's for all of these drugs. Um, some of them have um, affect the blood counts to varying degrees. So some of them are, are much uh, harder on the blood counts than others, um, but uh, all of them do affect, all chemotherapy drugs do affect the blood counts to some degree. Um, and so because we lower that, that blood count, it can lower your clotting cells, your infection fighting cells, your regular sort of uh, red blood cells that supply the oxygen um, to your body. Um, that can make you feel tired, um, that can put you at increased risk for infection. Um, mouth sores can be common with 5-fluorouracil. Uh, often we have supportive medications like mouthwashes to help you through that. And then um, importantly, um, and one of the serious side effects that we warn our patients about are the fact that there can be spasms of the blood vessels. Particularly, we worry about spasms of the blood vessels on the heart um, because that can cause chest pain or heart attack very low risk and quite rare, but a fairly severe side effect. And so it's always important to be aware of that um, and to seek medical care as appropriate. Um, capecitabine, as I mentioned, is a very similar drug to 5-FU. Really, we describe it as the oral version. It has 
almost all the same side effects as the 5-FU. Um, it has an added side effect of hand and foot syndrome, which is something where you can get redness, um, discomfort, and sometimes peeling of the hands and feet, which can be quite uncomfortable. Um, that can also happen with, with 5-FU, but is a bit more common with capecitabine. Um, uh, so we do mention that one. And we also talk about the diarrhea that can happen with capecitabine, which can be occasionally very severe um, and considerably worse than, than that which you might have with um, 5-FU. Um, moving over to the other side of the page, the oxaliplatin, the most common side effects that we talk about with this are nerve sensitivities in the fingers and toes. Um, and so that's kind of like a numbness and tingling sensation. For, for most people that should go away between cycles, but as you get more cycles of chemotherapy, uh, more treatments, um, that can sometimes make that numbness and tingling worse. Um, that is expected, but if it's very severe and you're having lots of trouble doing up buttons and walking, or if that's causing problems, um, then certainly uh, your primary clinic would want to know about that. Another side effect of oxaliplatin that can be a little bit uh, scary the first time you may or may not experience it is the cold sensitivity. And so uh, on the day that you receive your treatment and the next sort of 48 to 72 hours, you might, uh, if you do drink something cold or you go out in a Winnipeg winter without mitts or, or you know, um, or a nice scarf that covers your mouth um, and you breathe in that cold air or you feel something cold, you get a really, really uncomfortable sensation in your fingers and your hands. Um, and you may have a sensation of, your throat closing, which is certainly not uh, pleasant. Uh, you're not having a situation where your throat is closing, but it just feels that way. So that's something to be aware of with oxaliplatin. There is also nausea associated with oxaliplatin. And so uh, we have built-in supportive medications to prevent, hopefully prevent um, and manage any nausea that you may experience. Um, Arinotecan is also one of our common drugs. Uh, most common side effects are diarrhea. You, you must be sensing a theme here. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, many of these drugs do cause diarrhea, which can be troublesome. And then again, the low blood counts um, can be fairly severe with irinotecan. And so that does pose an infection risk. Um, and that's something to be aware of. The other thing that I haven't listed here, um, but that is uh, fairly common is change in taste. And so that can affect you day to day. Um, um, I will let our, our lovely dietitian speak more to that, um, but certainly that, that's something that is common um, and can be experienced uh, by, by our patients. I also wanted to just kind of go over the common side effects of targeted therapy. Although um, they can be very tolerable treatments, uh, when the side effects do occur, they can be rather bothersome. And so unfortunately, although we have a lot of new helpful treatments, um, they are not without their own side effect profile. Um, and so, uh, starting off with immunotherapy, uh, this can cause inflammation really of any organ system. And that's because when you activate the immune system, there's a possibility that it gets a little bit confused and targets its own cells as opposed to only the cancer cells. So this may manifest in a, in a way um, as uh, a rash on the skin, uh, low or high thyroid levels. Um, it can cause trouble with the bowels, again, diarrhea. Um, and it can cause trouble with the liver, so uh, impaired function of the liver. Um, all of our patients are monitored for these side effects and checked in on, um, as many of you know. Um, and so we do our best to try and um, um, head off any of these side effects if we see them happening or to manage them if they do occur. Other uh, targeted therapies can have a variety of side effects based on um, which particular uh, treatment you're receiving, um, but just a sort of not extensive list, but sort of a common list would be things like rash, fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, potentially visual changes, um, 
or like a gritty feeling in the eyes, uh, blood pressure issues, which are monitored carefully, uh, potentially issues with bleeding and potentially blood clots. If we look at the treatments that are available for metastatic uh, colorectal cancer, they're considerably expanded in the last uh, many years, uh, particularly in the last five years. But we do have some of the drugs that I commonly mention, so that 5-FU, um, capecitabine, oxaliplatin, irinotecan. And then we have a few more targeted therapies um, that target specific um, mutations and cancers. And so that's why that molecular profile and understanding each person's individual cancer is important. So drugs like bevacizumab, panitumumab, cetuximab, um, you absolutely don't have to remember these names. You should receive handouts uh, regarding these. Um, but if you're on these drugs for any length of time, you may become familiar with them. Other drugs like encorafenib, Ralitrexid, and here is uh, pembrolizumab, which is that immunotherapy. Right now, many of the targeted therapies and immune therapy drugs are used primarily in the metastatic setting, um, uh, although there is likely some evidence uh, that will be coming in the future to consider using them in um, the uh, earlier stages of colorectal cancer. Um, but we don't yet have access or funding for those drugs um, as yet in Manitoba and many places in Canada um, are not yet using them uh, outside of a clinical trial. So I, I briefly wanted to touch on outcomes. Uh, again, every individual's outcome is really dependent on um, what sort of stage of cancer you have, the biology of your disease. Um, and so I would encourage you to touch base with your own team if you have any specific questions regarding that. But I just wanted to put up this graph to illustrate that um, if we even look at the last, say, 10 years, um, if we look at, so this is immune therapy here, these are some of the targeted therapies. Um, so although we you know, have consistently been using our 5-FU and our chemotherapy drugs over the years, we started to incorporate immune therapy more commonly. We've started to incorporate these um, more targeted uh, drugs more commonly in the last, unfortunately, this graph only goes up to 2019, but um, really there are lots of new treatments that have come out since, if you look at 2004, we only really had five things and now we have a whole host of things. So really patients are living longer. It's largely due to improved detection of disease as well as this uh, graph, which illustrates our improved treatments over the years. So I just wanted to talk about clinical trials because this is um, often something that uh, is, is interesting to patients and something that some of, uh, some of you may be interested to explore. Um, if we ask what is the benefit of clinical trials, so we can break it down into sort of different groups. For the patient, for you folks, um, access, it might potentially be uh, access to a drug that's not yet available. We, um, we sometimes uh, open those types of trials here in Manitoba, often we do, um, but these trials are also available across the country um, in other centers. Um, we also talk about benefits of feeling like you may have a more active role in your cancer treatment. And then of course, there's the benefit of that altruistic feeling, you're feeling good about helping to further the knowledge of, of the uh, of this disease um, um, and the treatment of the disease. And then also that feeling of helping, um, helping future patients. Um, uh, and so that's the second group here, future patients. We know that, uh, you know, you have that knowledge that newer therapies are potentially effective and improve survival. And then for health professionals, um, clinical trials help us to further advance medical knowledge. It helps us to also provide newest treatments to patients. Um, and then also these clinical trials help to add to the body of evidence that help us to be confident that we're offering the most beneficial treatments to our patients. We also talk about the risks of clinical trials. So as with all of our treatments, clinical trials also come with potential risks. Um, so the investigative treatment potentially 
might be more toxic um, than the standard of care treatment, um, although we often have uh, very good ways of managing that. Um, there's a possibility that uh, you may be given a non-beneficial or potentially harmful treatment. Again, there are checks and balances in place to prevent that um, from uh, continuing for any length of time, um, but uh, potentially a risk. Um, when we randomize, meaning assign people to different, uh, different uh, arms of the treatment, so different categories of treatment, there is a possibility of getting a placebo treatment. However, uh, it's important to note that you will always receive a standard of care treatment if one exists. So if there's a standard chemotherapy or targeted treatment in one treatment arm, that is always given because of ethical considerations. We certainly will always give an effective treatment, even if the patient is on a clinical trial. Um, but in the cases where there is no clear effective treatment, there is a possibility of getting a placebo drug, meaning, um, meaning getting sort of a a sugar pill or, or sugar water, that sort of thing. And then for some folks um, who may live out of town or who have mobility issues, um, the time commitment for clinical trials and participating in clinical trials can be very uh, excessive. Um, there's often lots of blood work involved, lots of check-ins with the doctors and nurses, um, and then also um, potentially travel because the places where we carry out clinical trials are in our main cancer care center here uh, in Winnipeg. And so um, if patients aren't really able to travel for that, uh, it's, we, we, can't, uh, we can't enroll them into the clinical trials. So what do we have going on now today uh, in Manitoba for um, our current clinical trials? So they have these very not special names, but I'll sort of go through them one by one. So CCTG, CRC.9 is uh, actually called a phase two to three study of looking at something called circulating tumor DNA um, as a predictive biomarker in that adjuvant chemotherapy, so after surgery, in patients with um, stage 2A colon cancer. Um, and that code name of that trial is something called COBRA. So they usually have uh, more fun, uh, memorable names. Um, the other trial that we have is a surgical trial. Um, and so that's looking at non-operative management for locally advanced rectal cancers. And that's run by our surgical colleagues. Um, there's another clinical trial um, that's a phase three trial. It's also called CHALLENGE, and that's looking at a physical activities impact on survival in patients with high risk, either stage two or three colon cancer. Very interesting. Um, and then there's another trial here that um, uh, is something called IROCAS or um, uh, or this sort of non-fun fun name. Um, and that's looking at it, it's an international trial that looks at a triplet chemotherapy, meaning three different drugs in combination um, as compared to the two drug combination that we standard use in high risk stage three colon cancer in that after surgery setting, in that adjuvant setting. Um, so I just wanted to talk about um, uh, the two, two trials just a little bit more in depth just to give you an idea. So this um, CRC9 or this COVR trial um, is looking at something called circulating tumor DNA. And this is something that is uh, sort of new, a uh, new horizon of uh, potential um, uh, biomarker, meaning that it gives us potentially a chance to uh, detect uh, cancer um, where sooner than we otherwise might be able to um, and potentially predict patients who might uh, benefit from chemotherapy after having surgery. Um, and so in, in just to give a bit of background, um, after having a surgery, all of your cancer that we can see is removed, um, but there are maybe sometimes microscopic disease. And in that case, we often, depending on the stage, we often give 
uh, chemotherapy to kind of mop up all of those potential residual cells that may be there. In stage two colon cancer, this is a little bit less clear right now. And so we're trying to um, see if this circulating tumor DNA, so if we can take some blood and identify this DNA from the tumor, this might predict people who might benefit from chemotherapy after surgery in low risk groups who may not otherwise receive chemotherapy. And so this is recruiting patients across many Canadian and US cities. These are often international trials that we participate in. And your oncologist will certainly let you know if you're eligible for this type of trial. There's another trial that is recently closed, um, and I only bring this up sort of to give you an idea of um, just the extent of patients and centers that participate in this. So we had 174 patients um, who were recruited from 30 different sites across Canada to participate in this trial, which is very similar to the other one I just discussed. So that's circulating tumor DNA, um, looking for um, whether that helps to inform giving chemotherapy in that after surgery setting, but this time in stage three colon cancer. Um, and this one was called Dynamic 3. Um, and uh, again, um, this is a, sort of a new horizon potentially for us that might become important in the future. Uh, and it's, it's a lot less invasive than trying to get a piece of a tumor with either a colonoscopy or, or potentially a surgery, um, but taking some blood and potentially being able to identify um, the DNA from the tumor um, what might, might in the future become very uh, important and much less invasive way to detect cancer, sometimes called a liquid biopsy. Um, so now I just want to move, so that's a sort of a, an overview of some of our clinical trials. I wanted to move to surveillance um, and then survivorship. And I'll sort of just let you know that um, this is our, our uh, particular way that we follow patients who have now been, who have now completed all of their treatments for their colorectal cancer and are deemed um, uh, cured. And so we continue to follow you for a total, well, not us specifically, um, but uh, you will continue to be surveilled for at least five years. And this is, this sort of um, framework is provided uh, to your follow-up specialist. So either a family physician, a nurse practitioner, whoever is following you for your other medical issues once your care at Cancer Care is complete. And so we typically recommend uh, medical follow-up every six months for the first three years and then annually, so at least once a year, physical uh, for the following two years to complete five years. We don't often recommend uh, following what's known as a CEA. This is sometimes known as a tumor marker. Um, really, um, if this has been helpful in following your cancer, it may be recommended by your treating physician, but is not standardly needed. And then looking at CT scans to see if there's any recurrence of cancer, we typically recommend one time uh, at the first year and then at year three. And then in years four and five, unless there are any concerning symptoms, we don't typically recommend that. Chest x-rays and then fecal occult blood tests um, are uh, so that test where you take the poop and you sort of smear it to see if there's any blood. Um, that's not typically recommended. It's not routine. And then a colonoscopy is recommended at least one year after your initial surgery. Um, and then uh, the person who does your colonoscopy uh, will make additional recommendations depending on what they see. But um, uh, usually, if everything looks okay, it's four years after the initial surgery, three years after that first year one colonoscopy, and then every five years forever. Um, and then other things that we monitor or that your uh, family physician will monitor is looking at any symptoms that... Um, that cause any problems. So changes in bowel habits, new bleeding, uh, troubles with, um, with bowel or bladder function, et cetera. And then finally, um, with regards to survivorship, um, you know, there may be 
uh, many concerns related after completing your cancer treatment. Cancer treatment is not easy. We recognize that. And you may have, you know, concerns regarding um, cancer returning or growing. Um, there may be concerns regarding um, side effects following chemotherapy. Um, you may be experiencing mood issues related to having went through the treatment, the diagnosis of cancer. Um, you may not feel quite the same. You've gone through a lot, um, you know, surgery, uh, chemotherapy, um, your body image might be different and uh, interacting with, um, with a romantic partner may, may be different as well. Um, sexuality and intimacy uh, certainly can change for patients who are either completed their cancer treatment or who are living with cancer and having ongoing treatments. Um, we do have an excellent psychosocial oncology department, um, and so that's counselors who help to talk with you and uh, who can help you to deal with some of the emotions um, and concerns that you may have following uh, receiving treatment or while you're on treatment and dealing with um, your cancer journey. Um, and we also have um, access to uh, sexuality counselors who deal specifically with intimacy and sexuality and body image. Um, and we also have excellent um, allied health services, as, as you'll hear about, um, with our, you know, dietitians and physiotherapists um, and, and ostomy nurses, etc., who provide excellent care um, to patients who are dealing with um, the side effects as well as um, you know the issues that affect your quality of life. Uh, I would encourage you to touch base with um, with your primary clinic if you need referrals to any of these services, um, um, or uh, to discuss you know um, any of these concerns that you may have. So you know each cancer journey is different. I want everyone to know that effective treatments do exist for all stages of colorectal cancer and um, your cancer care team is really here uh, to support you through this process and um, we hope that you do feel supported through this process. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, this is just a link to the Cancer Care Manitoba website where more resources can be found. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it back over to Kathleen. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a very informative and helpful presentation. Um, thank you. Well done. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our next speaker now, uh, Robin Chambers, who graduated from the University of Manitoba and completed her dietetic internship at the Health Science Center. She's a registered dietitian member of the College of Dietitians of Manitoba. Robin joined Cancer Care over 19 years ago, and for the last several years, her primary focus has been providing nutritional care for patients with GI cancers, including colorectal cancer. Welcome, Robin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm just going to share my slide. I hope everybody can uh, share my screen. I hope everybody can see that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking to you about eating well after a colorectal cancer diagnosis. Whoops. All right, so over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing the benefits of good nutrition after a cancer diagnosis. And then I'm going to be talking about what the nutrition recommendations are, both while you're going through active treatment and after treatment. And then I'm just going to touch on the nutrition services that are available here at Cancer Care Manitoba for patients and families. So nutrition recommendations or nutrition goals are really going to vary depending on where you are along the cancer trajectory. After a cancer diagnosis and while you're undergoing active treatment, whether that's chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, or targeted therapy, the focus is going to be on meeting your nutrition needs, which are often increased during treatment. And cancer and cancer treatments can change the way you eat. It can affect the way your body tolerates certain foods and uses nutrients. And you may have to adjust um, your diet to help manage eating problems. 
And then once your treatment is completed and you've recovered, um, the focus is going to be more on reducing the risk of recurrence or prevention of a secondary cancer or maybe other chronic diseases, which as a cancer survivor, you are at higher risk for. And these recommendations are going to be very similar to the primary prevention recommendations um, prior to a cancer diagnosis. So eating well is one of the best ways that you can keep your body healthy both during and after cancer treatment. Eating well also helps keep up your strength and energy. It helps promote healing and recovery. It helps prevent unwanted weight changes. That might be weight loss if you're going through active treatment, maybe due to some side effects or poor appetite. And sometimes, actually, it can be weight gain. There are patients who gain weight while they're going through treatment. And eating well is also going to help minimize muscle breakdown. Um, it helps maintain um, the health of your digestive tract and will also help lower your risk of infection. One of the probably one of the most important nutrition recommendation, recommendations during cancer treatment is to make sure that you're eating enough protein. Protein is needed for growth and repair of body tissues. Um, it plays an important role in maintaining your muscle mass and your strength. When your body doesn't get enough protein, it might actually start to break down your muscle tissue. Um, and while you're going through uh, treatment, again, whether it's post-surgery or whether you're going through chemo or radiation, your body actually needs extra protein, anywhere between 30 to 50 percent more protein. So to make sure that you're meeting your protein needs, it's important that you're including high quality protein choices every time you eat. So at all meals and snacks. And just to give you a few tips and ideas of what are good sources of protein, that would include things like eggs, your dairy products. So whether that's milk, hard or soft cheeses like cottage cheese or ricotta, yogurt, particularly Greek yogurt, fish, and that can include even canned fish like tuna, salmon or sardines, any type of poultry, meat, and that would include beef, pork, or wild meats, your nut butters like peanut butter or almond butter, nuts and seeds, legumes. Now legumes are things like dried beans, peas, and lentils. And then there are also soy products that are a good source of protein that might include tofu, soy nuts, adamame beans, or soy beverages. And I just wanted to make note the the little stars there indicate uh, more plant based uh, protein food sources that are often high in fiber. And so I just wanted to make a note that some of those you may have to avoid or limit if you are experiencing diarrhea or abdominal gas. Well, the second nutrition consideration while you're going through cancer treatment is to make sure that you're drinking enough. Fluids are so important during treatment to protect your bladder and your kidneys and to prevent dehydration. Most people are going to need at least two liters or eight cups of fluid every day. That doesn't mean that it has to strictly just be water. Fluids can also include diluted fruit juices, electrolyte replacement drinks that are lower in sugar like G2 or Gatorade Zero, um, broth-based soups, herbal teas, and vegetable juices like V8 or tomato juice are just a few examples of some of the fluids that you can, uh, that you can take in. And you want to be sipping fluids slowly and constantly throughout the day. Room temperature is often um, good. It helps with hydration and it helps lessen some of, side, some of the side effects like nausea and diarrhea. If you are losing weight while you're going through your treatment or if you're not eating very well, then you want to choose fluids that have a little more nutritional value. And that would include things like milk. And if you have difficulty uh, with diarrhea, or you're having trouble um, with milk, 
you could choose. There's a lot of different uh, lactose free products out there right now. You could do things like homemade smoothies or shakes. Um, you could do liquid nutritional supplements or cream soups. Those are just a, a few examples that of fluids that are also going to contribute um, to your hydration. Now, Anna talked about a lot of the potential treatment side effects. And depending on your treatment, you are likely going to experience some of these side effects. And they're going to vary from person to person. Some of these side, side effects are going to make it more difficult to eat or drink. So during this time, you may need to modify your diet or your food choices to help manage things like changes in appetite, um, nausea, changes in your bowel or ostomy outputs. And this often means adjusting the fiber intake that you're eating. You may also have to adjust your diet if you're experiencing um, or you're at risk for a, a partial bowel obstruction. Um, mouth sores can be a real problem or the sensitivity to the cold liquids or foods. And of course, again, taste changes are also um, common with treatment. So if you are, and unfortunately, we just don't have time today to go through um, all the different modifications and management of all these different side effects. But if you're experiencing one or more of these common side effects and it's affecting your ability to eat, you would definitely benefit from more of an individualized nutrition care plan from one of our dietitians here at Cancer Care. Well, I'm going to switch gears now. Um, I noticed in the polling question um, right at the beginning that Kathleen did, um, it did indicate that a lot of you were completed your treatment. Um, so I'm going to be touching on what the recommendations are after you've completed your treatment and you've recovered. And the first goal really is just to eat a healthy diet to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence, um, as well as other chronic uh, chronic diseases, which could include diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, or hypertension. The recommendations that I'm going to be uh, very, very briefly touching on come from a colorectal cancer report from the World Cancer Research Foundation and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And these recommendations are based on the most recent research from around the world. And prior to going through these recommendations, I do want to just um, say that some of you might be experiencing more chronic, longer-term side effects from your treatment, which could make following these recommendations a little more difficult. Well, excess body fat is one of the strongest factors that increases the risk of at least 12 different types of cancer, including colorectal cancer. So after treatment, the goal would be to main, try to maintain or achieve a healthy body weight. So if your weight is higher than what is healthy for you, even losing about 10 pounds or so and keeping it off can benefit your health and reduce your risk. There is convincing evidence that daily moderate physical activity reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. And the goal would be to try to aim for about 30 minutes of moderate activity each day. And walking is one of the best ways to get that, uh, that activity in. Walking more, sitting less. Physical activity is also really important for managing, managing fatigue and increasing your energy levels. When we're actually looking at the diet, eating a diet that's high in uh, plenty of high fiber foods lowers the risk specifically for colorectal cancer. So what you want to do is when you're thinking of what you're going to eat, fill up your plate, um, at least two thirds of your plate with plant-based foods. So that's going to be whole grains. It's going to include your vegetables, your fruit, and your legumes. And we also know that plant-based foods have a protective effect against cancer. Kind of on the other side of that, we want to try to limit the consumption of fast foods or other processed foods that are high in fat, in starches and sugars. And these would include things like fried foods, um, 
things like granola bars, crackers, sugar sweetened yogurt, baked goods, potato chips. Those are just a few examples of what we would classify as, as processed foods. These foods um, are quite calorie dense, which means they can lead to weight gain, which we want to avoid. And so really what you want to do is choose more minimally processed whole foods. And I do want to make a note here that um, about fat in your diet, because it does say to avoid, um, you know, these processed foods that are high in fat. And things like olive oil, other vegetable oils like canola oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, nut butters, fatty fish, cheese, whole eggs. These are, uh, these are foods that contain fat, but they're from whole foods, and they are a very important part of your diet. One of the ways to help maintain a healthy body weight is to avoid consuming sugar sweetened beverages. And these would include things like pop, like regular pop, regular sports drinks like Gatorade or Powerade, fruit drinks, and even fruit juices, specialty coffees that have uh, all those added uh, syrups in them, and even things like commercial smoothies are all very, very high in sugar. And these sugary drinks have been identified as a cause for obesity, which increases your risk of cancer. In addition, there have been some studies that um, have shown that avoiding sugary drinks also directly reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. Consuming processed meats um, and uh, high amounts of red meat is, uh, it has been shown to be a cause of colorectal cancer. So to reduce your risk, limit red meat to no more than 350 to 500 grams, and that's the same as 12 to 18 ounces per week. So I just want to identify what red meat is. It's um, beef pork. A lot of times people think pork is the other white meat, but in fact it is red. Whatever the color the meat is raw indicates um, whether it's a, a red meat. Lamb and goat and also any wild meats would be considered uh, red meat as well. And I also want to point out here that it's not saying to avoid red meat, it's saying to limit red meat. So red meat can still be very much a part of a healthy diet. Um, it does provide Provide you with an excellent source of protein, iron, and B vitamins. The same can't be said for processed meat. When it comes to processed meat, there are really no, you know, safe amounts. So we want to try to avoid that. And processed meats are any meats that have been smoked, cured, salted, or have added chemical preservatives. So that would be things like your deli meats, wieners, sausage, bacon, ham doesn't mean you can never ever have those again, but you want to save them for more for special occasions. Um, there's also probable evidence that dietary calcium, both from dairy products and or uh, calcium supplements, can decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. It's best to get your calcium from food, but if your dairy intake is limited, you may need to consider taking a calcium supplement to meet your requirements. But again, I'd want to point out that taking too much calcium, particularly in the form of supplements over and above what's recommended, is, uh, is not a good idea to do either and can actually increase increase your risk of prostate cancer and, and possibly um, cardiovascular disease. The final point that I'm going to make when it comes to recommendations after treatment, and there's been a lot of um, information in the media recently in regards to alcohol. While the evidence is overwhelmingly convincing that drinking alcohol does increase uh, colorectal cancer risk, and so for cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol, but for people who do drink, the American Institute for Cancer Research recommends limiting alcohol to no more than two drinks a day for men and no more than one drink a day 
for women. And I do want to say that these recommendations are actually specific for colorectal cancer. We know the research indicates if you're drinking more than this particular recommended amount, your risk for colorectal cancer goes up considerably. However, other cancers such as breast cancer, there's really, again, no safe um, limit or safe amount really any amount of, of alcohol, no matter how small, does increase your risk. So I'm just going to close up now by just mentioning um, the nutrition services that are available at Cancer Care Manitoba. We have a team of four registered dietitians that specialize in cancer, and we can help you with your specific nutrition needs. As Anna mentioned earlier, these are really general recommendations. Your situation might be quite different. Um, so we can help you with that, provide uh, tips for managing side effects of your treatment. We can help you with if you've got questions about nutritional supplements or natural health products, or if you're just looking to, uh, you know, eat healthy after your treatment, um, we're here to help. We accept referrals from any member of the healthcare team, but you can also self-refer. Um, we prefer to see first, you know, for you the first time in person, but we also do virtual appointments and we'll do phone consults as well. And in-person uh, appointments are available at the McCharles unit, at the St. Boniface unit, and at the Victoria General Hospital. Um, and this is our contact information here, a phone number that you can call if you'd like to schedule an appointment, or certainly you can drop by uh, our nutrition services office on the main floor. Thank you, Robin. That's uh, thank you so much for being here and um, stick around. You both and Anna um, at the end of uh, our final presenter. Hopefully, we'll have time for some questions. I know that Anna has to leave a little bit earlier, so we'll we'll try and make time for that today. Um, our next guest is Carissa Lux, who began her career as a nurse on an acute medicine unit before transitioning to home care, where she quickly found her passion for wound and ostomy care. In 2006, she accepted a position as an ostomy nurse with the Manitoba Ostomy Program and has specialized in wound ostomy incontinence training. In 2020, Carissa became the program coordinator for the Manitoba Ostomy Program and has been there for over 17 years. Thank you for joining us today. I, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for including me. I thought we would keep this um, kind of an informal discussion today just because I know that there is um, sometimes uh, uh, some misconceptions around um, what an ostomy is. I know I've had them. And so I thought we could just um, have a, a frank discussion about, you know, for starters, what is an ostomy? And um, in my confusion was always, well, what is a colostomy versus a urostomy, which I had never heard of mm -hmm. before. And and um, hoping you can clarify that. For sure. Uh, so an ostomy is a surgically created opening. Um, created by the surgeon for the uh, el uh, elimination of body waste. So another word for ostomy, you might hear stoma. So the word stoma is often used interchangeably. Uh, and it describes the actual piece of bowel that you'll see on the on the abdominal wall. Um, so there's a few different types of ostomies. Uh, in terms of um, this presentation today, we'll focus mainly on colostomies and ileostomies. Uh, but there are three types. I, I do have um, a little screen share just of a picture of what a stoma looks like and then um, a diagram of, of what uh, the differences are. So I'll just see if I can do a little yeah, screen. Yeah, for sure. And I and I didn't even realize what, that there's a third one, an ileostomy. So. Mm -hmm. There is, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Get this. Yeah, we're sharing, or you're sharing your screen now. Okay, so um, this is uh, just a picture of a stoma. Uh, and so that stoma could be a colostomy, an ileostomy, or uh, a urostomy. Uh, and again, that's just describing that bud of bowel tissue that you see on uh, the, the tummy wall. I'm going to just to uh, another picture here. 
And so here are uh, three different types of stomas that uh, that uh, we are usually are referring to when we're talking about ostomies. So the first is a colostomy, and that is when a stoma is created in, in the portion of a large intestine. So there's different types. Um, could be a sigmoid colostomy, uh, ascending or descending uh, colostomy, but um, that would just be dependent on the surgery type. And so you can see in the first picture uh, with the colostomy uh, that we have um, the, the stomach, then the small intestine, all of those, uh, the, the long tube of bowel that is responsible for digesting the food. Um, and then the large intestine that travels up and across and then down. And so in this particular picture, we have a colostomy in the uh, sigmoid um, portion of the, of the uh, large intestine. So with an ileostomy, uh, this is an opening into the small intestine. So the end of the small intestine is called the ileum. And so uh, it is called an ileostomy. So ostomy opening, ilium uh, is the part of the bowel that uh, we're referring to. And then the third type of stoma that uh, you may, may hear of is called the urostomy. And so that is a, a stoma or a diversion in the, of the urinary system. So that one's a little more, there's a little more to it. And we're not gonna get into that one today, but just for, um, you know, just for general knowledge, there are three different types. Um, mm. For this discussion, we're kind of focused more on the colostomy and the ileostomy. Mm. And, the, and what happens in, you know, um, a lot of the times is when someone goes for surgery, it's not always known if the person's going to have a stoma at all. And if they have a stoma, there could be a few different options uh, depending on how that surgery goes. And so, we try to give, we do see clients preoperatively. And so we try to give uh, them a bit of information about both. Okay, so um, Chris, I just wanted to ask, so the, the name of a nurse that you might see is, uh, and, and you can, I'm not familiar with this acronym, but it's NSWOC. Could you tell us yeah. what, a, what that type of nurse does and why you might be referred to that type of nurse? So we are uh, NSWOC nurses, so the, abbreviation uh, stands for nurse specialized in wound, ostomy, and continence. So um, in our uh, program, uh, the Manitoba Ostomy Program, we focus on ostomy um, specifically, but in hospital, the NSWOC nurse may also be um, referred for wound care um, and, and other um, continence issues. Usually, I would say the majority of our specialty is focused in wound and ostomy. Uh, so we are uh, bachelor prepared nurses, so we're BM nurses. And then after we graduate, we would pursue then uh, an additional diploma, which is uh, anywhere from 12 to 18 months, depending on the program you take. And then that is when you become uh, an NSWOC nurse. So if someone is referred to an NSWOC nurse um, before surgery, does that mean that they will necessarily have an ostomy? So that's a question that a lot of people will have when they come to see us. Um, so seeing an NSWOC nurse before surgery does not mean that ne you'll necessarily have an ostomy. Uh, but we know that providing basic information about ostomies before surgery can help to provide the client with some basic information and it just takes away some of that fear and the mystery of what a stoma is, what an ostomy appliance looks like. Um, and so sometimes when someone, when, when a client comes to us, they know that they will have a stoma. They have been told by the surgeon, yes, I'm having an ostomy. Other people will come in and say, you know, it's a possibility. They're not sure yet what they're going to, you know, what will happen in that surgery. Um, and then from there as well, we have people who are, who come in and say, you know what, this shouldn't be needed. The surgeon has said probably not, but we encourage all surgeons um, who, who are doing any type of, 
of a GI surgery to refer their client to us just so that we can provide that information in the small chance that, that they do have a stoma. Um, then the person wakes up with a sense of knowing, okay, I can, I can handle this. It's not as scary as what I thought it was. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are all ostomies permanent or are some of them not permanent? So not all are permanent. Uh, we, they could be temporary. They could be permanent. So when, when stomas are, when someone undergoes surgery, um, again, that, that's sort of one of those additional unknowns. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, uh, someone will say, yes, I'm having a stoma and it will be permanent. So in, in, in the case of colon and rectal cancer, uh, rectal cancer, there is a certain, um, margin from, uh, the anal sphincter where, um, if the tumor is, is sort of within that margin, then it would be a permanent stoma. And if it's, if it's, you know, further up where there's, where we know that sphincter is not going to be, um, damaged in the surgery, then theoretically, if, uh, everything else, all, all other things considered, then it could be a reversed, um, and temporary. Now, temporary di means different things for different people. So, uh, in, again, in terms of, of someone who's undergoing uh, cancer surgery, um, if the person is going to require chemotherapy after the surgery, that that temporary is extended a little bit longer. So, uh, the, you know, the, the priority at that point after that surgery is completed, um, they want, you know, the client to undergo chemotherapy and any other treatments that are needed. And then about three months after those treatments are completed, then they can proceed with the reversal. If, uh, and then if, if there is no additional chemotherapy or treatments, you know, we're talking more of a three to six month kind of a turnaround. So it's quite, it, it can be quite, uh, the time frame can vary. Yeah, variable. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, you referred to it as an astonim, uh, ostomy, sorry, ostomy appliance. So how does the patient take care of that? Is that something that you teach people how to, to take care of in the program? Yeah. So with, um, so what happens is uh, we will see them pre uh, a client preoperatively and provide some basic information. We'll show them an ostomy appliance, um, and I do have I have a pouch here because it's a, it's also often something that you know people are not quite sure of what to expect. So this is a very basic ostomy appliance, um, and so we'll show a person how to take care of that and manage it. And basically, it's. Um, the back has an adhesive barrier and it's very skin safe. There's no latex. Uh, there's very low chances of, of allergies to this type of a product, but it has a very good adhesive. Um, what happens is we will measure that butt of bowel or the stoma on the tummy, and then we will cut the product to the correct size and then we'll put it on. Uh, so this is on the, the tummy for three to four days at a time, sometimes up to seven if it's a good seal. And then uh, it comes up and a fresh one is applied. And in the meantime, uh, during, you know, throughout the day, sometimes at night, if depending on how active the stoma is, it would be emptied from the bottom. So the bottom has this little Velcro opening. Some have a clamp. Most of them are Velcro now. And it just opens up. Uh, and it unrolls and then it empties into the toilet. And so a person would just go to the bathroom when it's about a third full, because it will just, the stoma will naturally empty um, as, as the, the contents are moving through the bowel. You won't, they won't feel the urge to go. It just naturally passes in. And when it's about a third full, the person will go to the bathroom, sit on the toilet and then just empty this um, into the toilet and this stays on the tummy the whole time. So um, they would just sit down and just empty directly into the toilet, close it up and then away you go until the next time it needs to be emptied. So oh, thank um, you for explaining that. Um, yeah. yeah, and so how does this impact on somebody's lifestyle when, when they have a, um, an appliance like this? Uh, so, you know, it. It's a, it's a challenging question 
because it's definitely different for every person. I, I would say every person's journey uh, is definitely unique after ostomy surgery. Uh, and it can be, you know, there's additional challenges when you're undergoing uh, cancer surgery or a cancer diagnosis at the same time. And, and you're navigating, you know, chemotherapy and all the other things. So in terms of physical care, I always tell a person the physical care is, is probably the easiest part, um, but it's the, the psychological recovery after the surgery. Um, if you have a stoma, uh, learning to accept your new normal, the, the body as it is, and then um, just taking the time to um, kind of make friends with, with your body again. So it, it's, um, that journey can, is very different for many people. So that's like a whole separate um, presentation. Yeah, but, but in terms of the physical, um, the lifestyle changes um, from a day to day, um, you know, after the surgery, six to eight weeks after surgery, you always have those, you know, limitations just with activity and exercise. And that's not ostomy specific, just general surgery, right? The lifting and the, you know, um, we've had some people go and run a marathon four weeks after surgery. And it's like, well, okay, not something we want to, a normal person to do, like the average person. But if you've been running marathons every day, yeah, okay, it's fine. Um, so, so there are some physical um, rest activity restrictions. We do focus on core strength after a, a, a ostomy surgery. So because the bowel tissue is pulled through the abdominal muscles, there is always going to be a weakness in that abdominal uh, wall. So it's really important to focus on some good core strength and the right exercises so that you can help reduce the risk of hernia formation after ostomy surgery. Uh, we do have some guidelines to give to our clients that are have been prepared by a physiotherapist. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, and then as in terms of uh, diet, diet will change depending on the type of stoma it is. So if you have a colostomy, there's really no diet changes, um, but we wanna make sure that you're, the person is still focused on a, a, a good, healthy diet uh, with high fiber um, because constipation can still occur. With an ileostomy, there are restrictions and we won't get into them today, but most of them are temporary. Again, during those first six weeks during the healing process. Um, in terms of clothing, a lot of people have questions. What can I wear after ostomy surgery? There's a pouch on my tummy now. You know, are people going to see uh, going to see the the pouch? And I'm just going to um, quickly uh, share another part of my screen here. And so I wanna share this because I found these pictures today and they're just really nice pictures that show, you know, how you can go back to wearing the clothes you like. You can wear denim, you can wear leggings, you know, you wanna wear what's comfortable, but it doesn't have to change what you wear. Um, the important part about it is that uh, you are not putting the, a belt or uh, the waistline directly over the stoma itself. So um, as long as the waistline is below or above the stoma, then you should be good. So in the first picture with the denim uh, and the flannel shirt, it looks like the stoma is probably uh, just above the waistline there. So the, the, the appliance is tucked into the, into the jeans. And then in the second picture, um, with the person in black, uh, they're wearing, uh, they've kind of got the, the jeans, just the button undone, and you can see the stoma, uh, sort of the ostomy appliance is completely covered by the, by the waistline. So the stoma would be below in that picture. So it just kind of shows, you know, you can still wear what you like. Um, and then the other, um, the other question we get a lot is, what do we do with bathing, showering, swimming? Is it, is it safe to do, is it okay? So I'm just going to, um, I just wanna put it this, there, we go. a little better, okay. So this is, a, I just really like these pictures because they show people 
basically just getting back to their life. You know, there's someone at the beach. Um, they're showing the pouch. Some people are, it, it really depends on where you are in your journey. And if you feel comfortable showing the pouch, you don't have to show the pouch. Um, there are, you know, one piece bathing suits or, you know, the two piece with the longer, um, like a tankini kind of style for, uh, or, or just like a rash guard t-shirt um, that you can cover, you know, your, if you want to be more discreet, but you don't have to be. The pouches are waterproof. They're older proof. You can bath, swim, or shower. So we've got someone in the bathtub there. Um, yeah. So if the appliance is leaking, which can happen from time to time, it's not the water that's, that's the problem. It's, it's, there's something else that we need to troubleshoot. And so that's, uh, our job is in SWAC nurses to, uh, to troubleshoot that. I'll just go back to that. Can you tell us a, a little bit about um, what other supports are available for rostomy in, in, uh, in Manitoba? Yes. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> uh, sorry. I got, I got stuck with my screens there. Um, so in terms of supports, uh, the first support I would say is the Manitoba Ostomy Program. So this is the program I've been working with for 17 plus years. Um, any person who is um, who has surgery for an ostomy will be registered with our program. And from that program, uh, the person receives nursing support services and also uh, the, the ostomy supplies. So we provide the supplies 100% coverage um uh through manitoba health and so um people can self-refer so for example if someone is coming from out of province they can they can give us a call and we can register them ourselves um most of the new referrals will come from the uh hospitals so health sciences st boniface brandon hospital grace hospital grace hospital is where we will um, see clients as an inpatient and so um yeah, so there's so we are the main uh, support. I would like to to hope. Um, so we do clinic visits, we do phone calls, we can do virtual. Uh, we have rural clinics across the province as well. There are two locations, so our office in Transcona, and then also Brandon is the second location for the ostomy program. So people, but then if clients have had surgery at St Boniface or Health Sciences, they continue to see the nurses at those hospitals. So. Thank you. We are running a little bit out of time, and I know you did want to talk a little bit about changes in diet as well, but I would just encourage anyone watching, if they have those questions, to, to reach out to you at the uh, Manitoba Ostomy Program. Yeah, would that be helpful? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yep, for sure. That's no problem. So our phone number, I'll just read it. It's 938 uh, 5757. Um, and uh, yeah, you can call us, and, and we're happy to uh, to help. Right, and it, also if somebody wants to um, email me, I can also give you uh, Chris's contact information if you have further questions. So, because we are running a little bit behind now, so um, we'll probably have to end that discussion here. Thank you so much for joining us, Carissa, though. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, our, our last speaker today is um, someone who has actually been a regular attendee in our webinar audience. So it's lovely that she's uh, agreed to step into the presenter role and share her patient story today. So welcome, Mira. Um, we only have a, a shorter time left now, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing your experience with uh, colorectal cancer. Okay, well, um, it started uh, at the end of October in 2019 when I went to the bathroom uh and saw blood and i happened to have my phone and i took a picture of this bloody mess and called my doctor and got an appointment a couple of days later and um it was a colonoscopy and i didn't really worry about it um the colonoscopy was done in january of 2020 and it was uh, rectal cancer i was then referred to my oncologist who prescribed capsetabine and radiation together. Uh, it was at stage three. And uh, after all the uh, testing and so forth, we started, but they also mentioned that there was a suspicious spot on my lung. And they didn't make a 
big issue of it at the time because the scan simply showed that the rectal cancer was at stage three and had not metastasized. So I went through the uh, chemo and then it was followed by surgery, chemo to shrink the tumor and chemo and radiation to shrink the tumor and then surgery. And then once I had recovered from that, um, I had another round of, of chemo um, to, to uh, prevent reoccurrence. Then in December of 2020, my oncologist phoned me up and said, you remember that spot on your lung? And I said, no, <laughs> I really don't, but what's the matter with it? He said, well, it's another different kind of cancer. So back to the surgery in January of uh, 2021 to remove my lung cancer. And that was at stage one. So I was very lucky because normally lung cancers are found when it's too late. Um, so I lost a chunk of my upper left lung. Uh, there was no chemo after that. And um, I was allowed to get back to more or less normal. And then my bowel was put back together again, 10 months later from the initial surgery. So, you know, I've been coping with um, the side effects of chemo, which is your peripheral neuropathies and cold precipitated neuropathies and, and then um, um, having to go to the bathroom frequently. But it's way better than the alternative, which was uh, to die with cancer. So um, I'm grateful to the huge team of people that have uh, spent an awful lot of time keeping me alive. And uh, like I said to yourself one day, I think uh, I better I better stay alive. Otherwise, I'll disappoint this lot of this enormous group of, of surgeons and nurses and everybody else. So I'm still here and I'm very lucky. That's great. It's a big investment, I guess, that people have oh, made in you. <laughs> is it ever? And, and truly, I'm yeah. grateful. I mean, yeah. it, it is a gift of life. Yeah. Uh, were there um, certain parts of the presentation today that really resonated with you, Mira, in your, your experience? Yes, all the side effects from the, the chemo and so on, the diary and, and everything else. The, the only side effect that I avoided um, was um, uh, the um, hand and foot that that uh, was mentioned and uh, I didn't get any mouth ulcers you know eating is a problem anyway because your taste changes and you don't feel like eating and you're losing weight and you're feeling really very miserable with it all um, but to have mouth ulcers on top of that would have just uh, made made maintaining weight uh, a terrible terrible issue for me anyway mm -hmm. I'm not very big Mm -hmm. uh, I'm five feet tall and my normal weight is between 105 and 108 pounds. And I was riding around 92, 93 pounds. So I was really um, worried about maintaining my, my muscle strength and mass and uh, um, more or less ate as much as I could all day long, you know, because you can't eat big meals. You have to eat, but then you have to eat very carefully and say, okay, what's my caloric, like, we need calorie bombs, right? I, I need to have lots and lots of calorie dense foods. Um, so maintaining weight was my problem, big problem for me. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of the strategies and supports that you use that, that helped you get through all of this, what, what did you find that was helpful that you'd recommend? I talked with my, when I was getting my treatments, I talked with my nurses weekly. I mean, I saw them every week. I took a set of notes with me as to how I was feeling. And then they would pass this on to the doctor. And I saw him every couple of weeks. Um, and, I, and I did talk to Robin as well. Um, she solved a bunch of problems. And I found a whole lot of internet resources, which I've emailed to you, um, that I found very useful. One of them is a cookbook for ostomates. And I made use of that um, a lot. So there, there are resources, but I think the best ones have to be making sure that you talk to your healthcare team and, and that you're honest about what you're feeling. Because if you're not, they don't really know. And if you're feeling really miserable, you better tell them because somebody out there can help you. So I made use of the, the, the physios, all my nurses, my doctors. Um, I also uh, reached out to... Um, uh, well, actually, it was my doctor who mentioned that I should go to the physical fitness program at the Refit uh, called Moving Forward After Cancer. And uh, it gets you going with exercises and what's best for you and how, how, to, how best to go about it. So all the physio people are out there as well. And you know what? The first 10 weeks are free. 
And it's a real wonderful program. I would encourage everyone to take it. And if for more information on that, you can certainly uh, contact me and I can also share um, the list of resources that Mira had um, suggested that had been helpful for her. So she did um, um, organize that ahead of this session today, which is wonderful. Um, and we do have, yeah, information on the Moving Forward After Cancer program. Um, and another thing I wanted to ask you is about your involvement with uh, this newsletter, because I had read your story in the Inside oh, yes. Out uh, newsletter. So you can tell us a little bit about that um, support group. Yeah, that support group's pretty wonderful. I was in hospital. They weren't able to visit me because of COVID, but I got uh, phone calls from um, one of the ladies there. And she rang me about once a month finding out, you know, how are you doing and what's new with you? And, and I mentioned that I was having problems with my appliance that was leaking. So she suggested I talk to the NSWAC nurses and nurses and um, I had to describe my problem. Again, they didn't want me to come into hospital because of COVID, but um, what they suggested was a different type of appliance, which worked for me. And she said, if this one doesn't work, you have to come down. We have to look at what's going on with your ostomy because uh, it could be something in and around the skin area. Maybe the skin's not holding up or whatever, because you're prone to infections and you're prone to all kinds of other issues with, with your ostomy. I mean, can get blocked as well. Um, I can't eat mushrooms, for example. I, I was told not to eat certain foods because they can plug you up. And then you're back in the hospital, you know. So I had to be very, very careful with my, my diet and uh, what I could and could not eat. And that's why that uh, cookbook was so helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, the, the, the group is wonderful. They hold, they hold meetings every month and they send you a newsletter it's full of all kinds of information. And you can call any one of the people there and, and tell them what, what you're experiencing and they'll guide you through, talk to this person or that one. But it, ultimately they tell you to go back to your NSWAP nurse and your doctor um, for, for issues. But there are products that are out there um, that, that are very helpful. I mean, with my diarrhea, for example, I ended up with hemorrhoids. And so what do you use? Do you run to your doctor every day or how do you figure that one out? Um, so there are there are products that are helpful. And, and my combination was to use a 1% hydrocortisone cream and then follow it up with uh, something like a preparation H, which is a sticky uh, uh, petrolatum based ointment. And that, that worked for me. But it might not work for everybody, you know. This is um, really helpful. You're sharing your experience, and I, I, I did want to touch a little bit about your, um, your hobby as a musician because I think that that's <laughs> having this passion in your life somehow also kept you going through all these difficult things that you've gone through. After, after I went through my surgery, my first, one of my first questions to my um, surgeon was, now that I've come through, when can I start playing my trombone? And he went, oh, <laughs> not till I say so. And uh, so I asked the same question of my thoracic surgeon. He says, oh, uh, not till your gut guy says so. So between the two of them, they had to decide that I was healthy enough to play. But the benefit of playing a wind instrument was that um, my lung function was very good. And I recovered from the lung surgery very quickly. I mean, I was in hospital, went in on Monday and left Thursday morning. And um, I, I attribute that to uh, my um, my lung function, which was... Uh, which was built up over many years, um, blowing into this brass tube. So, but <laughs> the three years that I had to wait, I had to beat on drums and, you know, <laughs> do other things with my hands. Well, good for instead. you. That's inspiring. Um, I'm going to just invite our other guests to come back to um, the, the screen where we've kind of gone over our time. There was a question, and I know that Anna had to leave, but um, Dr. Paul has uh, agreed to to step in, there was a question about um, hernias that was asked and about uh, whether there was a recommendation to wear a hernia belt and also about developing core, core strength without um, aggravating the hernia condition. So um, Dr. Paul, would you care to, to uh, weigh yeah, on they're that? Yeah, they're, they're both excellent questions. And I think it's really individual, right? I don't think one person fits all, right? And I think that Lots of patients who have hernias find that if they're small, that they are 
they can manage them. For larger ones, certainly I have patients that find the belts are quite helpful for them. Obviously, if the hernia is painful or sore, um, then that is something that should be checked out probably by their surgeon, right? Making sure that uh, there's not something else going on than just, just a hernia. Um, uh, when it comes to weightlifting and so forth, you know, I often recommend they see a physiotherapist, can often give them exercises they can work with that can help improve that core strength. Yeah, so two, um, I think, important referrals that we've t touched on a little bit here. I know we didn't really get a chance to, to discuss as much as we wanted to about diet and uh, Mira's touched on it, Robin, of course, and, and even Chris is saying, um, you know, about the adostomy and um, definitely uh, contact us if you would like information about getting um, an appointment to see a dietitian and also the physiotherapist that is, is also the service offered through cancer care and patient family support services. We can put you in touch with that program as well. So. Um, we don't have any other questions in right now, or perhaps we do. Um, yeah, just a, a, a thank you from uh, one of our attendees that asked that question. So I do want to um, end things here, so I'm not keeping people longer than I had planned. <laughs> um, thank you, Anna. I know you're not here, but um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for stepping in. And thank you to Robin and Mira and Carissa. And to all of you, our guests that um, have joined us today. So please feel free to contact me at Patient and Family, uh, the Patient and Family Resource Center if you have any questions and I can always pass them on to our guests for further um, answers. And uh, if you could, uh, so please uh, take a moment to complete our evaluation because we really appreciate your feedback and it helps us plan future sessions. So uh, thank you all again and have a good night to everyone. Take care for now.